Welcome to today's reflection from Christchurch. So I get a, a daily email of a, of a verse of the day, and yesterday's was from Philippians 2, and it just prompted me to this reflection. Let me read it. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, right at the beginning of that, there's an interesting use by Paul of the word if. If there is any encouragement in Christ. Now, the accepted view is that he does this to challenge the Philippians to reflect on whether they are actually living their lives in the way that he's listing. And of course, it's a challenge that is just as valid today. Do I live my life always showing Christ's love, always being in accord with fellow Christians? always showing humility in the way that I view others? Do I always look to the interest of others? I wish I could answer yes to each one of those challenges, but honesty compels me to say that there are definitely times when I get it wrong. We live in a world today which increasingly emphasizes self, but we have been given an amazing opportunity to be different. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be different from our world. We can show such radical love to others. And doing that, it presents a challenge to them. The challenge of trying to understand why they're being treated well and how anyone can be empowered to behave like that. But I also wanted to come back to that word humility. See, it often seems to carry with it something negative. And I still remember from school days, yes, a very long time ago, the false humility of, of the hypocrite Uriah Heep in Dickens's David Copperfield, a falseness that left me very cynical, even though Dickens drew a sympathetic portrait of a humble Pickwick in Pickwick Papers. That one never resonated quite as well. But humility, still, it, it seems almost out of place in our world. And yet I came across a very interesting quote from The Economist magazine from 2013. It was written at the time of one of the conferences of the great and the good that were held in Davos. And it reads, if leadership has a secret source, that's S-A-U-C-E, it may well be humility. A humble boss understands that there are things he doesn't know. He listens, not only to the other bigwigs in Davos, but also to the kind of people who don't get invited, such as his customers. Humility is a key element of leadership. Who would have thought it? And yet it's absolutely true. Recognizing that we're not always right, listening to others, demonstrating that we care what happens to them, Showing that we're different in a good way is probably the most effective way of leading people to the truth, the most effective form of evangelism that any of us can get involved in day after day. Effective because it's so clearly a demonstration of changed lives, lives that are different, lives that live by a different set of rules. Effective because like Paul's challenge to the Philippians, it makes people think makes them wonder why someone should behave like that. And I can vouch for this. I became a Christian when I worked out that the only reason that 11 frightened disciples could change and be bold was that they had indeed seen the risen Christ. So if that was true, then everything else was true. But the, the, the factor that went along with that is that I was meeting with a group of people who were just different. They were nice, they were kind, they cared. 
they supported. It mattered. That was effective evangelism. I do want to make a, another point, however. Humility and, and treating others with respect and love is not the same as being a doormat, always getting taken for granted or exploited. After all, Paul does go on to say that we are called to look to the interests of others. And it isn't in their best interests if we encourage and support bad behaviours. There will be times when, for their own sake, we have to firmly and lovingly correct them, when we have to say it like it is. But yes, we must do that in love, with the humility to acknowledge that sometimes, maybe oft times, we too can get it wrong. And then Paul also says that the believers should complete my joy by being of the same mind. This doesn't imply a, a drab intellectual and behavioral uniformity. Rather, that believers are to use their different gifts in, in a working together cooperative spirit with a focus always on the glory of God. And that's why we're called to be in a fellowship. We're there to support, encourage, challenge each other and to bring together our God-given skills for the sake of others. This genuine caring for the interests of others is a radical challenge. It is radical love, and such radical love is rare. Which is why if you read on in verses 5 to 11, Paul goes on to show its supreme reality in the life of Christ. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That is radical love. That is our example. Let's pray. Lord, help us to live our lives looking out for the interests of others. Help us to live with your radical love that we might honor you in all that we say and do. Help us to live so that it makes not yet believers ask the question, why? And help us to guide them to you as the answer. Amen. Uh, the song I've chosen is an old one from 1988 by Graham Kendrick. It's called Such Love. Have a great day. God bless. <laughs>